Good morning and welcome to the service of morning prayer for Wednesday the 20th of December. I hope you're keeping well. This is the third Sunday, third Wednesday of Advent. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The kingdom of God is at hand. O come, let us worship. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous may not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 16 to chapter 4, verse 6. Then those who had revered the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord took note and listened, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered the Lord and thought on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, my special possession on the day when I act, and I will spare them as parents spare their children who serve them. And once more you shall see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that I will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sun of the righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out and keep leap like calves from the stalls, and you shall tread down the wicked, for there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. He with the Spirit is saying to the church, thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading for this morning is taken from Mark chapter 9 and reading from verse 9 to 13. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they, he had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. They then asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man, that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did not hear, they did not do to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. John Bunyan in writing The Pilgrim's Progress, wanted us to view our life as a pilgrimage, one in which the journey and its related discoveries about ourselves are as important as the destination. Who the pilgrim becomes in the journey is as important as where the pilgrim is heading. What shapes the pilgrim's character is as important as the end point of the story. And while it's couched in the language of the Reformation, it might seem a little too religious for some of us. The truth of the book has held true for centuries and still holds true for us today. That life is a pilgrimage. 
The Hebrew people were a people of pilgrimage. The stories of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah and Rachel only make sense when we read them as stories of wanderers. The stories of Moses and Joshua and their wandering in the wilderness and their quest for the promised land only make sense if we read them as stories of a pilgrim people. And even when the Hebrew people settled the promised land and built a temple in Jerusalem, they imagined themselves as a pilgrim people. All their major religious festivals were reenactments of their life as wanderers and entailed going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem in order to worship at the temple. In light of that, the book of the Psalms contains a collection of songs that were used by these pilgrim people walking their way up Mount Zion and to the Temple Mount. And they had a temporal description to themselves, Psalms of Ascent. There are 15 Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And they're built upon the common set of assumptions. Firstly, they are contained together in the Book of Psalms and are all entitled A Song of Ascent. Secondly, they're associated with three annual festivals found in Deuteronomy 16.16 16, and associated with the verb go up or ascend. Thirdly, they contain a recurring theme associated with the name of Jerusalem or Zion, even if they were written for individuals or for the community. Finally, while they address the common concerns of everyday life, they have a common destination in mind. Jerusalem is the destination or goal because it is where God is present for God's people. Psalm 125 is the sixth of the Psalms of Ascent and deals with that common human struggle between good and wickedness. The primary focus of the psalm is not upon the good or the wicked, but rather upon how we relate to God or the Lord or Yahweh. Thus, verses 1 and 2 are bookended by how we relate to God and the use of two similes or images to describe the state we're in. It is then drawn to an end with that surely, sometimes translated for, at the end of verse 3, and then a prayer for the good in verse 4 and for the wicked in verse 5. What defines the relationship with the people of God in verse 1 and 3 is trust and protection. The people trust and the Lord protects. The image or the simile that the psalmist uses for the people who trust is that of Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. The image that the psalmist uses of God is that God is like the mountains that surround Jerusalem at all times. In this sense, the writer of the psalms is using the very geography that the people were using for their pilgrimage to describe the relationship between themselves and God. As they ascend the Temple Mount, they look down on the city of Jerusalem, and around them are the surrounding mountains. There is a question among commentators on the psalm whether the phrase, the scepter of wickedness, relates to foreign rulers or those Hebrew rulers who were themselves unjust and wicked. Irrespective, there is a recognition in the psalm that such leadership leads the people to wickedness or causes the righteous to do what is wrong. Contained within that psalm is the recognition that the awareness of the corrupting effect of dominant evil and that in living life the righteousness of the righteous is dependent upon the goodness of the Lord. So much of our contemporary understanding of Christmas from songs about Santa to the introduction of the elf on the shelf revolve around that central human issue of good and evil. Those cultural expressions put the emphasis on the idea of reward, gifts for being good and coal for being bad. But other than through the emotional manipulation of human effort, it goes, gives no indication of how we meant to get there. Psalm 125 ends with a prayer, do good, O Lord, to those who do good and are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will leave a, lead away with evildoers. It suggests to us as pilgrims that our own choice to do good and to be upright in heart or to turn aside to our own crooked ways is the path that God leaves us to. 
that irrespective of the destination, we are the ones who choose the inward journey of the self. And God is the one who responds in grace by either feeding the good within us or offering us the opportunity to refocus, repent, and to turn, which is the very objective of the psalm. As Advent reminds us, while we live our, out our faith as a lifelong pilgrimage, we are faced with that constant choice to grow in good or to decline into wickedness. And in choosing good, we know the goodness that God has planted in us is nurtured and grown. Amen. We firm our faith together in Hero Israel. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This morning, for our intercessions, we'll use the intercessions for Advent. O wisdom from the mouth of the Most High, you reign over all things to the ends of the earth. Come and teach us how to live. Lord Jesus, come soon. O Lord, the head of the house of Israel, you appeared to Moses in the fire of the burning bush, and you gave the law on Sinai. Come with outstretched arm and ransom us. Lord Jesus, come soon. O branch of Jesse, standing as a sign among the nations, all kings will keep silence before you, and all peoples will summon you to their aid. Come, set us free, and delay no more. Lord Jesus, come soon. O key of David and scepter of the house of Israel, you open and none can shut. You shut and none can open. Come and free the captives from prison. Lord Jesus, come soon. O morning star, splendor of the light eternal and bright sun of righteousness, come and enlighten all who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. Lord Jesus, come soon. O king of the nations, you alone can fulfill their desires. Cornerstone, you make opposing nations one. Come and save the creatures you fashion from clay. Lord Jesus, come soon. O Emmanuel, hope of the nations and their saviour, come and save us, Lord our God. Lord Jesus, come soon. God of power and mercy, you call us once again to celebrate the coming of your Son. Remove those things which hinder love of you, that when he comes, he may find us waiting in awe and wonder for him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Just a reminder that our service for the fourth Sunday of Advent is on December the 24th at 10 a.m. Christmas Eve uh, is also on the 24th, and our service is at 9.30, and it's a Eucharist. And then on Christmas Day, we'll have a Christmas Day Eucharist at 10 a.m. on the 25th. Please do note that the church office will be closed from December the 26th to December the 30th, and there will be no midweek service on December the 27th. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.